about Ben and Jerry, but I was ashamed of serving Ben and Jerry for the amount of time that he did. It drove me crazy because they're so anti-conglomerate here. And I want to support independence, and I'll talk about that. But, but here's the big problem. This is what I'm hoping that a group like this can accomplish. So, Ronnie Brook, it's in Pine Plains. Great, uh, they produce awesome milk, they make ice cream now. Um, they're an hour from here, an hour and a half from here, right? So, you'd think that I'd be able to get their products, right? Not the case. I've called several times to get their ice cream before I got this email. And the funny thing is, they go to me, we're in Ellenville every week because we pick up bottles. I said, great, can you tell my ice cream? He goes, that's not a frozen truck, we pick up bottles on it. <laughs> he goes, we can't get you ice cream. So then I speak to the vendor. Well, they don't come to Ellenville, so they can't get you ice cream. I said, so you're an hour and a half away from me, and I can't get your product. And I have to resort to Ben and Jerry's. And it was, I was ashamed by it for so long. And so, but by sending me an email, it really prompted me to say, okay, now I really have to get on a mission to get Ben and Jerry's out of here. So I kept searching and searching and searching, and we came up with Adirondack Creamery, which are out of Kingston. And it turned out perfect because the company that we do business with, Gillette, who's in New Pulse, now started distributing them. So even though the products are out there, the farmers are out there, the whatever, the bottles are out there, whatever's out there, to get them into our doors as small business owners, it's not so easy sometimes. It's more complicated to deliver the product than to make it and produce it. So that's hopefully right. When I heard this organization, I was like, wow, there's probably going to be a lot of other people in the same boat that I'm in. You know, I need more producers. I need more um, streams of delivery to get the products to my door. And you know, this is hopefully that's what we can accomplish and share ideas and do things um, and make things happen like this. So I can support Ronnie Brook. Um, in the past, when I've done stuff like this, when I was in Colorado, the restaurant that I was a partner in, we bought from 57 small farms, and I got 10 other restaurants together. We sat down at a table on one side, the other side were the farmers. And I rounded up all the farmers, I rounded up all the chefs, because I couldn't get the products I was looking for in Colorado Springs, of all places. The farmers wouldn't come here. It's like, you when we opened 10 years ago, the farmers would stop in High Falls. A lot of them still do, they won't deliver to me here. Ellenville is out of the way, and they'll go right to High Falls, and it's like, I'm just a few minutes down the road. I want your lettuce. And in Colorado Springs, it was different, because I got 10 chefs together, we got the farmers together, and we looked at the farmers and said, we have $5 million worth of the purchasing power here. And their eyes lit up. So I bought all my potatoes from one farm all year long and negotiated the price ahead of time. Or they told me the price, because I never negotiated a price with a farm. And that's, that's really one of our big philosophies. If somebody shows up and they sell me something, or this or that, I go to a farm, I, go over, I never negotiate the price. The farmer, I assume, is charging what they need to do to make a fair, honest wage. It's not my job to say, you know what, will you take a buck less a pound, a cent less a pound? It's my job at that point to now say, I have to really highlight that this is, these are local green beans, these are local heirloom tomatoes, and I need to get the extra buck on the table. So now I have to bring that product back. I have to train my staff to perceive more of a value, which it is more of a value, to get something that's just picked, supporting our community, this and that. So it's really my job to do that. So that's my one philosophy is I never negotiate with a farmer. The price is the price. And I'll tell them sometimes, you know, I just can't afford that. I, I just, there's no way I can afford that, but I never say, you know, I, I gotta beat you up on this. You know, one of my, the gas delivery guy, I'll beat them up. You know? <laughs> Waste management, I will beat them up every single month. <laughs> when it comes to, you know, supporting independent and, and, and farm to table and, and, and supporting local, you know, for us, we've taken it to a, a whole different level. A lot of you have had drinks here tonight, and um, I don't know if you ordered something that we didn't have. And I am so anti-public traded companies, so anti-conglomerates. And my big thing is, when you give me your dollar, I want that dollar to go to an independent farmer, distillery, producer, whatever it is. Yeah. In So uh, local's great, but I can't buy Brandy local. I can't buy Chianti local. I can't buy a lot of these things local. So when that dollar travels overseas or travels to California, I want to make sure that it's going to the proper place. So that's why behind our bar we stock no Diageo. Diageo owns Guinness. Diageo owns Johnny Walker. Diageo owns Tangeray, um, Captain Morgan's, Moet Chandon, Dom Perignon, 150 brands total. 
They are probably one of the most corrupt conglomerates out there when it comes into the beverage world. Um, Bacardi Rossi owns 200 brands and we have 27 production facilities. Bombay was created out of thin air. It's just a brand. There's no, there's never a Bombay distillery. There was some brand created by a marketing genius that said, let's do this. And they shoved the product into mainline production, into some big plant. So if we have a choice to give that dollar to a small gin maker in California or New York or up the road, I'm going to totally go with that over Bombay. I realize that Bacardi Rossi is an independent company still. Bacardi, you know, the people who own the Bacardi company, it is a true independent, it's not public. But what a massive, massive company. So, you know, for me, that's not doing business. That's supporting a system that is set up like a Walmart system. Buy a distillery, buy a brewery, tear it apart, take all the jobs away. Remember all those Rolling Rock commercials? Latrobe PA? 400 people lost their job when Budweiser bought Rolling Rock. Rolling Rock is made in Newark, New Jersey. Johnny Walker, no longer a plan. Diageo shut them down. They now brew at a main, or distill at a main production facility. And this is like this with Budweiser's 200 brands, Diageo's 150 brands, Brown Foreman has another 75 brands. It's these conglomerates, and they're ruling, our, they're ruling behind the bar because not many restaurants are willing to speak up and say, you know what? I'm not going to serve Absolute. I'm not going to serve Johnny Walker. I'm not going to serve Captain Morgan's. But we're all conditioned to walking into a place and it's Captain and Coke, Bacardi and Coke. You know, so that whole thing here is all about rethinking it and retraining it and training people that, hey, you know what? We have a lot more options for a dollar. We have a lot more options for what we drink. I have 400 spirits behind the bar and not really one big brand. There might be one or two intermixed in there, like I have a bottle of Johnny Blue that's left a little bit. I can't wait for the bottle. I'm going to smash the bottle. I, I have for three, four years before I put the ban on Diageo. So, and when I do these, I tweet about it, I put it on my blog, I write about it, I do videos about it. I'm so proud of doing stuff like that. I'm proud of putting my money towards a small independent. And it really all started back because of Diageo. Um, I didn't want to get into politics too much, but Diage is a member of ALEC, A-L-E-C? Yeah. Uh, ALEC, yeah. Yeah, those evil bastards. <laughs> so not only is Diageo a member of ALEC, American Legislative Church Council, in a nutshell, they write our laws, bribe our senators on the state level, and hand off le their legislation for a signature. So Diageo is a corporate board member of these. And I feel that, you know, we have problems enough, you know, trying to get laws, you know, in our favor and, and doing business and this and that. Everybody knows New York is one of the worst states in California. So, you know, for me to give money to Diageo is fueling the fire. I don't buy from Walmart in my personal life. I wouldn't go to Walmart to buy from my restaurant. So that's how we set up our whole buying program. It's looking for small independents. So when somebody sends me an email about, hey, why don't you have Ronnie Brook? Why are you using... Ben and Jerry's, and I was so embarrassed because I was embarrassed to serve, and now somebody's actually calling me out on it. <laughs> and I'm not 100% perfect. Believe me, I'm not 100% perfect. I'm sure you can find flaws if you look around and talk to me. But man, I'm so conscious, though. So I'm being conscious and asking. So when you go out to a restaurant, the next time you order a beer or, or a drink or something or a wine, ask that restaurant for something local. Ask them for something independent. You know, ask them, hey, have you been to any of the local distilleries, local breweries? Because a lot of restaurants talk local, 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 farm the table, farm the table, farm the table. They get there and they have something from a great farm, but they have nothing local to drink. And it's so upsetting. That's where I think the ball drops off on restaurants when they go farm to table. It doesn't stop in the kitchen. It needs to go into the bar. So if you haven't been onto my blog, it's chefonamissionblog.com or chefonamission.com. And I do tons of YouTube videos. I've already got 500 YouTube videos on my main YouTube channel. And I talk about stuff like this. In fact, this is being recorded. And this, will be, this will be up there tomorrow. So if you missed it... Somehow I got it, stuck doing it'll this, though. <laughs> so, um, so please, um, reach out to me. Send me an email. Um, if you know any small producers of anything anywhere or a suggestion like, hey, why don't you have Ronnie Brook? Shoot me an email. That kind of stuff helps. That email, was that person who sent me an email here today? That gave me the, <laughs> that gave me the motivation. That really gave me the motivation to say, I want to get with Ben and Jerry's. You know, that was like I thought my last like, weakest link, it was one of my last weakest links. So that gave me the motivation to do it. So you never know when something changes the mindset of somebody. And people always say, Marcus, how did you get involved in healthy food? 
and sustainability. And I said I've been doing it since 1997, 98. And those times, you know, the word you know, sustainable fish and stuff like that, and organic was in its infancy. And people were like, well, how did you get started with that? And I said, it took one person to ask one question. I, was just, I just got the job, I was 24 years old, I just got the job as an executive chef at a country club in Colorado. And the vice, ex vice, ex president's wife came up to me, the club, and said, Marcus, can you buy beef without hormones and antibiotics? I looked at her and I said, why would they put hormones and antibiotics in beef? And she goes, oh, oh, let me give you some papers to read. <laughs> and that one question sparked the whole revolution in 1997 and 1998. That is where we are today. From that point on, I want to know where my food comes from. When we lived in Colorado, Colorado's a huge potato state, number two in the country. We visited farms that wouldn't eat their own potatoes. And we asked the farmer, why? Because we have to spray neurologically damaging chemicals on the field. By law, we can't go in the field for seven days after we spray the chemicals. If we lose irrigation, we'd rather lose our crop than go fix our irrigation. And I said, that's insane. I said, so what do you do? He goes, we had our neighbor's potatoes, he's organic. True <laughs> story. Yeah. So it's really, you know, at that point on, I'm meeting people that wouldn't eat their own food. And I'm a chef cooking this food, and I'm responsible for everything in my restaurant. That really scared the hell out of me. And then Jane became pregnant with her, our first Courtney. And I was like, now I'm responsible for you and the restaurant. It's all for myself. I screwed myself up so bad. Now I'm responsible for a baby. That was like, oh my God. That was like the wake up call. It's like, okay, let's uh, read the cliff notes of sustainability and healthy eating and proper uh, business etiquette and you know, sustainable business. So that's how it all began. And so, you know, let's network, let's talk, let's do the right thing, let's, let's have a, uh, a good glass of local wine or uh, independent cognac from France. Thank you very much. Link to Marcus's blog is now on our Facebook page. So in case you can't find it, just go on to the Rethink Local Facebook page and you'll be able to go right, right in there.